Glad you're here. Let's get started on this exciting teaching that we're doing before you give up. We're talking about, this is part four of the installment, we're in the Gospel of Mark, chapter nine, if you've been with us. And what we're talking about is giving you principles, giving you an understanding that there are some things that are going to happen to you that will make you feel like giving up. And I know some of you will say, you know, not me, but what I, I will tell you if you ask any believer who is living out and trying to live their faith in God, they will tell you there's been some horrific situations, some circumstances, some things that have happened where they felt like giving up. They will never voice that, but that's what we have to do. What do we do before we give up? Because once you give up, you get out and then you give in. I'll say it again. Once you give up, even if it's just in your mind, you get out and then you give in. But we're getting ready to go into these principles of understanding our faith. Because that's what this text is going to teach us. It's going to teach us the principles and how to make sure we have enough faith to believe in God. I know it sounds funny, but there are believers who do not believe. Ooh, we're going to get into it, so I want you to go with me. Let's pray right now so I can get into this text. Father God, I thank you tonight that as you are here with us, I ask you to grab every mind and every heart to let them know that you're still a God, a God who has all power in your hand. There's nothing too hard for you. And if we are going through a situation, if anybody's hearing me, is going through a situation or circumstance, God, where it looks hopeless, then, Lord, I ask you right now to renew their mind, renew their heart, and most of all, renew their dedication to their faith and belief in you. I give you glory, and I give you honor, and I ask you to bless the words that I say to make sure there's words in what you once said. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go with me to Mark's Gospel, chapter 9. What's exciting about this text is we've already seen it, and tonight we're going to go on what I consider to be one of the most important parts, one of the primary or one of the you know, elementary parts of our walk with God, that every now and then, as the old folks say, you got to go back to the old landmark and understand what's going on. What has happened in this text? Jesus had just been transfigured. He comes down from the mountain, and there is a father, his disciples, a crowd, and the religious leaders. And they're all standing around, they're arguing, the father is arguing, the religious leaders are arguing with the father, arguing with the disciples. Jesus comes down, sees his disciples, turns around and says, what is going on? What are you arguing with them about? And that's when the father speaks up. Listen, the father says, uh, my son has been possessed by a demon. It throws him in the fire. It does this to him. And I came to your disciples, asked them to cast it out, and they could not. I came to your disciples. I, I came to the ones I saw walking with you every day. I came to the ones that I saw uh, as representing you. I came to the ones who said they believe in you. And they could not. All I'm saying to you is that's so important. I don't have time to teach it again. But what it's saying is just because you're a disciple, just because you're a believer, doesn't mean you have the faith. There's somebody sitting there with me right now. You're a believer. And something is overtaking you. Maybe it's a spirit of anxiety. Or there's trouble in your life. Or problems that come. And you're sitting there now. You may not say it. But there's some things that you have resolved yourself that I just cannot do anything about that. Wow. We're going to talk about that. I want you to know right now, we still serve a God who has all power in his hand. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus turned around when the man said they could not. He said, next words, you unbelief, unfaithful and unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? He's saying his own disciples who were walking with him didn't have enough belief or faith to handle that situation. Don't think it only happens to the disciples. If we are not careful to understand where we are in our faith, and maybe somebody right now is ringing a bell in your heart to know, man, 
Maybe it's just the fact that I didn't walk by faith in this situation. The faith is not faith in you, it's faith in God. That's what he said. He said, bring the boy to me. Call the unbelieving generation when they brought the boy to Jesus. And he asked him how long. And the father told him. And then the father said, if you can do anything. And Jesus said, if I, all things are possible to those that believe. And then the father said a word. I do believe. There it is. But he was honest enough to say, but help thou my unbelief. What? Revelation. That means even believers have areas in their life where they are walking the unbelief. It means even some of us can be hit so hard that we are walking unbelief. I'm telling you tonight, I want to share with you how to resolve those areas in your life that you've given over and you may not even know you've given over to the spirit of unbelief. And what happened? Jesus then took the boy, healed him, the demon screamed, and then came out. He picked the boy up by the hand. And now we're getting to, and this is where we left off, this is where we're starting this week, which is part four of this teaching. The disciples, as they were walking away, well, let's pick it up and read it. Um, let's look at verse... Yeah, verse 28, look at it. And when he was come, Mark 9, 28, into the house, his disciples asked him privately, how is it that we could not cast it out? And he said unto them, This kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Now, in a translation you have, it may just say prayer. And the reason that translation says that is because the, those who transcribed or those who interpreted the text said that in the early text, it didn't say prayer and fasting that came into the latter text. I don't care when it came in. I'm not going to discuss red line criticism and get into that kind of talk tonight. I'm going to talk about the principle itself. What Jesus was saying is that there are some things that will happen to you. In this case, the demon in the boy's life. There's some things that will happen that can only be taken care of by prayer and fasting. You can say prayer if you want to. All fasting is, is a refocusing on what I believe. What prayer is, is a refocusing on what I believe and strengthening my heart through it. You can pray, but if you pray a prayer, that is a prayer of unbelief. You say, how can I pray unbelief? When you pray and don't believe what you're praying. How do I get to the point that I know whether I believe it or not? It's your actions after you pray the prayer. What I'm saying to you, God is saying there's some things in your life that can only happen when you have faith in the prayer you're praying. Which leads us to, again, the elementary part of our salvation. Something you need to refresh and make sure you think about constantly in your walk. Even though we are believers and you are a Christian. If I ask you, are you a believer? Yes, I'm a believer. Are you a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian. You can be a Christian. You can say you're a believer and say you're a Christian and not be a believer or be filled with unbelief because unbelief means that I didn't approach this by faith. As quiet as it's kept, this Christian life is not designed to be lived any other way but except by faith. It's a faith journey. It's a faith journey. Walk. Faith is the only currency that brings miracles. Faith is the only thing that makes it work. We get lost in what we think we are, who we think we are, without watching the actions that come out of us. And when something does not happen, I'm here to tell you, it is not the God who says all things are possible. Looking at you tonight, some things are possible in your life. You just have to believe they're possible. And if you don't believe they're possible, you're going to be just like these disciples, and you're going to sit there with all of your time going to church, all of your shouting, all of your praying, all of your defense of, I'm a Christian, and still be walking around without power because it can only be given by faith. And that's why the disciples says, we could not. I want to get you away from could not. Maybe something in your life right now, you have allowed to stay there, and you have believed that it can't be fixed. And all I'm telling you is, in reality... It may not sound good. I've had to wrestle with this. It is unbelief. Because we would say, right off the top of our head, God can do anything. 
We're going to talk about this because when they left the house, it says his disciples asked him why we couldn't do it. I want to tell you why you can't do it, and I'm going to tell you how to do it. Because his father hid it. He said, I believe, but help my unbelief. You believe, but there's some areas of unbelief we need to talk about tonight. And I believe it will bless you. I was watching a television program. It was a Christian program where there was a young lady who had attempted suicide. And it was, you know, there was a backstory of abuse and, you know, neglect and all that. But when they asked the young lady what happened because she was a Christian, she said these words, and these words are what, uh, you know, kind of grabbed me. She said, um, I missed the days when I was fearless. You know, when I just ran around doing what I wanted to do. And, and, and I controlled, you know, the dirt, the, the land under my feet. I controlled where I went, how I went. Then all of a sudden, this darkness came and started feeling bad. I have God in my life. And when I got Jesus as my Savior, I thought everything would be fine. But even Jesus couldn't help. And that's why I did what I did. Don't miss it. That's what stopped me. You know, I want to put the TV on pause because the Holy Spirit spoke directly to me when I heard this. She said, even Jesus couldn't help. Jesus can't help. But when you get to the thought that Jesus can't help, it is unbelief. You right now need to understand as we investigate why did these disciples have a spirit of unbelief? What happened to these disciples that they had been walking with Jesus? They saw what Jesus did. But you need to understand, let's talk about the nature of unbelief or how to get our faith walk. You need to write this down. The word unbelief is the Greek word apistia. It means lacking confidence in a person or in what the person's abilities are. It also brings into play a willingness. Because see, in order to doubt somebody, and doubt and unbelief are different in this way. Doubt could be just one individual circumstance. Unbelief can be something that covers your whole walk. You can just doubt that God can do that. But if you doubt enough times, it turns into a consistent walk of unbelief. You, you get that? It means that um, the doubt should be a red flag to me to say, man, do I really believe God? Because what it's saying is, I don't believe him. If we go to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, 58, or you go to Mark 6, 6, the same thing will happen. It's an encounter or it's a description of the same thing with Jesus. You know, um, in Matthew's gospel, 13, 58, he came into his own country and he had just left other places doing miracles. And when he got to his place and he started speaking forth, you know, he, he read the scripture, from, said this prophecy is being fulfilled. They had heard about Jesus. He was going around all the surrounding towns. But when he came to this town, they started doubting or they had unbelief. Here's what they said. Uh, isn't this Mary's son? Don't we know his brothers and sisters? How did he get this much power? And the Bible says in Matthew 13, 58, look at that verse. And he did not many works there because of their apistia or their unbelief. Let, let that marinate in you because it means what I'm saying tonight is all of us could be guilty. It's saying that there are times in my life when I need to have God and the thing that is attacking me or the place that I'm at, I don't even realize it because I've, I've Christianized my whole faith walk. And you know, I argue with somebody if they tell me I don't believe in God. And yet a situation exists where my unbelief or my where I don't believe that God can do it. And a lot of times it's that familiarity and it's not making sure you keep God where he needs to be. God needs to be reverenced. God needs to be adored. God needs to be worshipped for who he is sometimes, not just what he's done. Many times we get caught up in worshiping God loudly, I mean aggressively. We, oh, God heal me, God deliver me, God. But God said, whoa, if I do none of that, just worship me, respect me for who I am, and then you'll have more belief in me. It would be the same thing if it was your parents. If you don't respect your mother or respect your father, then you won't have belief in what they could do. 
But respect automatically raises that person to a place of saying, I can trust them. Because that's what respect brings. I trust you. I believe you. What I'm telling you is you need to look at your situation and think, do I really trust or believe God? In Mark 6, 6, he said a little differently. Because here is what happened to God after he sees you walking with him, say you love him, say you believe him, you know, you speak it in tongues, you're jumping around, and here comes a situation in your life. In Mark's uh, version of this text, in Mark 6, 6, right there, you can see this, it says, and he marveled because of their apistia, their unbelief. And he ran around to the other villages and towns and kept healing. Did you get that? It may be that because you don't believe, somebody else out there will get their blessing, they'll get their miracle, and you will not get it because you will not say what this father said. I believe, but God, help my unbelief. I'm telling you, put that thing, whatever it is, whatever whatever it's doing to you, and tell yourself, this goes under the category of something I got to believe God for. Write this down. Somebody put that in the chat. Something I got to believe God for. Take your time, put it down, be honest like this father. He's teaching us how he learned to walk in faith. And that is, he was honest. I do believe, but help my unbelief. There's an area where I still have unbelief. This happens constantly by what we go through. There are times and situations in our life um, where things happen and because of our faulty understanding of God and because sometimes that the gospel is presented in such a manner that, you know, God is, again, that heavenly bellhop just delivering and doing things and a lot of the doctrine that you hear or the way that scriptures are uh, translated and especially, uh, especially in the area of faith. People will act like faith is this, you know, Keep no, it's going to be just what this father went through. Anguish, pain, struggle, our faith, to really have faith. Sometimes you don't even know it's faith until some tears come down your face. You won't even know I'm wrestling to get my faith until it is so critical that your mind is about to jump out of your head. You won't even know it's faith until you surrender with such an ambivalence that says, I don't care what else happens, I'm going to believe God. I, I'm not walking around halfway believing. I, I got to take that leap of faith and trust God. I'm going to talk about one area that we all get messed up. Somebody asked me constantly, I've had this question since I've been pastoring, why doesn't God heal everybody? And if you ask that question to some of your Faith teachers, they'll give you answers, you know, like, uh, well, the person doesn't have enough faith. Or, we've been healed already, but we need to claim it. Or, um, you didn't wait long enough for your healing. We'll give all kinds of excuses, and listen to me, some of that could be true. But here's the problem with that. That's not faith. Faith, when people tell you this, they're saying, they're putting all the onus on what you did or didn't do. And all I'm telling you is, it's, it's not what you did or didn't do. It's on what you believed or didn't believe. See, the, the, the real thing is, God may not heal me because part of my journey on this life is I will build his kingdom better from the position I'm in. Just like Apostle Paul. With the God said, I got a thorn in the flesh. He said, my grace, what is he saying? You can still function with that. You're going to be good with that. Uh, it's almost like looking at, uh, when you just look at the Super Bowl, which, good Super Bowl, wrong team won. And as I say that, you know I'm not a Kansas City Chief fan. But a cripple Mahomes is better than 80% of the other quarterbacks. All I'm telling you is, you just have to have a little faith in God and things will happen and... A cripple Apostle Paul will get the job done. Sometimes God got to let me grow through situations because that's the only way I will work. And that's the only way my power can be manifested. It's the only way I can do what I need to do for God. Sometimes our suffering is a gift 
to the world. God will let me suffer so I can show somebody else. And that will increase somebody else's faith while they're suffering. All I know is God never, always, never responds our way. And I need to let you know, all sins come from unbelief. All right, Pastor, that's a big statement. What are you talking about? When I grew up, parents did not set you in time out. They didn't put you in a corner. They would whip your behind. I know there's some dice action now, but I know there's some folks out there who know what I'm talking about. We obeyed our parents because we believed they would punish us. And the punishment was severe enough that we did not want to go through. So there were some things we did not do because we knew that there would be a punishment. So we didn't violate our, our, our parents' rules. Man, because there is sometimes not a ready, readily uh, action that comes from you violating or you sinning and you think you got away with it, man, you know what? You fell and bump your head because the scripture says that you're going to reap what you sow. That should let you not, that should let you know that even if I don't get it today, I might get it tomorrow. But what I'm trying to describe is this. When you sin, it's because you don't believe either in God's goodness or you don't believe in the repercussions, what's going to happen to you, the recompense is a good Bible word, or you don't believe some kind of way that God can do what he said. And, and, and that's, what, that's why I said Every sin we commit is because, you know, we have to grow to a point, but there should be a point where you've grown and said, I'm not doing that again. Or there should be a point where if the answer is not there, you should know, I just got to wait on the Lord. He'll renew my strength and bring me back. What am I telling you? That right now we need to study the sin of unbelief. Listen to this. We need to know if you believe God, if you walk in faith, you need to know that God is willing and wants to handle everything you're going through. That he's already made plans to bless you. Listen to this. Anxiety, envy, lust, bitterness, impatience, despondency, pride, misplaced shame, indifferent, regret. All of these things find their root cause in unbelief in God. Can I show you how unbelief can trans, uh, can can kind of correlate to a lot of areas in our life? If you look at 1 Timothy 6 and 10, the scripture says, For the love of money is the root of all evil. What did the writer mean? I believe if you translate that, it's saying that when you love the people who love money, it's a certain kind of heart. There's a certain kind of uh, belief in their heart. They believe. That it's, it's a heart that is not yielded to God. And how, how do I mean that? It's the kind, of, the kind of heart that can love money is the kind of heart that, believe in, that believes in the things that this world can produce. Think about it. They, they believe that pleasure, when you love money, they believe the comforts, they believe the stuff I can buy. So it says um, the root Love of money is the root of all. What does that mean? It means that an evil heart who is supposed to be following God will believe that things or that stuff is better than God. It stands for a person who says, I believe God, but I'm living for what I can get from man. I need man's, you know, affirmation. I need man to understand. I need to walk around with stuff so man can see I'm blessed. No, that takes you further and further away from God. Money is the currency of human resources. Faith is the currency of God. But it means that I don't believe the promises of God when I believe in money. Someone asked me about playing the lottery. And you know, we joke around about it. Well, it's not a joke. You know, you went out there and played that lottery and you hit. Bring us some. But that's, you know, that's the part people say because your heart should be convicted to give what belongs to God. But listen, I'm talking about the condition you got to be in to play. Make sure that your heart is not there believing that money is my resource or that money is what can help me get through what I'm going through. 
that money will be that eternal resource. So when you love money, it means you don't believe God. How do I know? Because in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, God said you can't love God and money. I thought that was, you know, when you get the Torah and understand, he said, it's not that he's saying, you know, that bad money. He said, no, check the condition of your heart. Your heart can't prize things and stuff and still prize this unrefutable, unending faith that God can give us that can bring anything into our lives. So, in order to illustrate this in a little time we have left, I want you to go with me to uh, Romans chapter 4. And let's look at Abraham. And we'll start reading at verse 16 and go down to 21 to illustrate to you that it was Abraham's faith in God's promise that allowed him to witness and receive the promise. He had to walk by faith. If you look at uh, this same chapter, Romans 4 earlier, it asked the question, was Abraham justified by faith or works? Was it circumcision, circumcision that he was justified by, or was it, did he receive his righteousness in uncircumcision? What it's saying is, Abraham walked in faith before he got circumcised, which is a work. But he used the work as a sign that he had faith. Oh, I wish I had time to talk about it. Sometimes we get this faith and works discussion and don't believe that, that most times when the Bible tells us about works, it's talking about the fact that if I am who I say I am, then some corresponding work should follow. So if you believe like you say you believe, some corresponding faith acts should follow. Some miracles should follow. Some troubles should be eased. Some things in your mind should be set to peace because you will say to yourself, I know I can trust and believe God. Think about what you're saying when you say God cannot do this. You know that the story was Abraham was over 100 years old and Sarah was close to 10 years behind when they actually received the promise and they glorified God. But let's read the passage so I can talk to you about how we get rid of or understand this nature of unbelief. Verse 16. Listen intently. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He is the father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls those things that be not as though they were. Calls all those things. And verse 18, against hope, Abraham believed in hope. So he became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief. There it is. Regarding the promises of God, but was strengthened and his faith and gave glory to God. Verse 21 gives us another one. Being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. This is why it was accredited to him as righteousness. The words that were accredited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us. Verse 24, to whom God will accredit righteousness for us who believe in him who raised Jesus, our Lord and Savior, from the dead. Flow with that. Abraham did not waver. Abraham was fully persuaded. Abraham knew that God moved faith, so he was hope against hope. Hope against hope. Fully persuaded. Uh, believing God could do it. All of those things say there's a transitioning point where unbelief takes me going against the things that I can see, the things that I know, and it makes me really have to look at what I believe. Man, if I'm walking around saying that God can't do it, and I didn't say it, but acting like God can't do it, it's just as bad. It means that you're walking around in unbelief. There are three things 
about faith that glorifies God. But I wrote this down because Martin Luther, who is considered to be the, you know, the, uh, the etymology of the Protestant faith, right? Martin Luther says, faith honors him whom it trusts with the highest regard since it considers him truthful and trustworthy. There is no other honor equal to the estimate of truthfulness and righteousness with which we honor him whom we trust. When you believe God, you honor God. When you honor God, your faith increases. And when you honor God, there's a better chance that what you're asking God for, you shall receive because now you've placed God in a proper... If I were to ask you, how's your faith? Just listening, a backdrop of everything I just said, how is your faith right now? If you were honest with me, you'd have to say, you know what, Pastor? There's some areas I can see from what you're teaching. I am a believer, but there's some areas where I let unbelief rule me. Even if it was just for an hour, or a month, or a day, that's unlikely. If you don't address it, it's probably still ruling you. But let's look at this, these verses we talked about Abraham, right? Being fully persuaded, um, hope against hope, you know, made sure that he trusts God. And even though his body was yet dead, he did not believe that. He didn't weaken in his faith. How did he get there? Three things about your faith that will tear down your unbelief and will glorify God. Um, first, faith, first thing faith does, write this down, gives you a future. Something happens, and automatically in my mind, is not, can God do this? In my mind is, how long it's going to be before I get out of this? Real faith says, not only is this going to pass, but I can stand through it, God will show up, God has the ability to help me, and when God shows up to help me, I'm going to be better off because of what God has done in my life. So I honor the promises of God, and when you do that, it takes you to a place where you know you have a future. In, in verse 19 of this text, Romans 4, it says, Being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body. Verse 20 said, he staggered not. Verse 21, and being fully persuaded. But if you look at verses 23 and 24, he said, not only Abraham has to live by this, but this was done for us. I'm going back now for you to understand that it's a faith journey. Faith is not faith because God showed up one time, you got the victory, and now you haven't believed or walked in faith since then. He's telling us, he's reinforcing in us that the just shall live by faith. That word just means those who are righteous shall live by faith. Not by what they see or believe, not by the level of pain, not by the level of pressure, but they will live by faith. That means they will live just like Abraham did. Watch. You got to make sure you want to judge your faith, put these three things on your faith. And being not weak in faith. Don't let the weakness get me. He staggered not, verse 20, and verse 21, and being fully persuaded. Good faith is a faith that says, it's the strongest thing I have, meaning that nothing takes the place. It is my priority when it comes to God, when it comes to this life, giving a choice. I will live by faith. Write that down. Reinforce it in your own mind. I'm going to live by faith. Now, in order to live by faith, you got to get in the Word. The Bible says faith come by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. The Bible lets us know that um, he, come, he had come to God. Hebrews chapter 6 must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. God said, I cannot reward a faith that is weak where I'm not the priority. Now, it's still faith. And I know you, I told you earlier you can have a mustard seed, but a mustard seed of faith still means that you're not weak in what you believe. It means that I know that the faith that I have is great enough to handle what I'm going through. I love it in 23. It said it wasn't written for his sake alone, but it was written to us so that it could be imputed into us. So, the first thing Abraham said at 100 years old is, I still got a future. 
The promise came, no baby yet, but he's thinking at 100, I'm gonna live long enough to see the baby. Even though I'm old, I don't worry about my body. I don't worry about Sarah's body. I'm still believing my faith. Those are the kind of things you gotta say. It sounds silly. You should sit there now and say, I know right now that I don't have the money, and I know that uh, you know the way I've been living, there's some pressures coming financially, but I know that if I keep walking my faith, doing what God asks me to do, that my faith is strong enough that God will supply all of my needs. I'm talking to somebody. I know right now that this sickness, the doctor doesn't know what it is, and I feel bad, and some days I feel like I'm going to die, but I got enough faith to believe that my God knows I'm sick, and I'll turn this sickness over to him by faith. My job then is to rejoice that I've given it to God and let my faith be the answer to my situation. Write that down. Faith has got to be the answer to your situation. I know it's hard. I'm, I'm sorry. I wish I could keep the etiquette of being nice tonight. But there will be some things that the enemy do in your life where you need to say, this faith thing is killing me. i got to walk by faith because I know it's the best thing to do. you got to know that. I'll never forget. I was going up to get my registration to my car renewed. This is during the midst of the pandemic. And I remember going up, you couldn't do it locally now. Uh, they took the motor vehicle because they cut staff and they only had certain areas geographically that would do certain things. So my, I had to ride 50 miles just to get my registration renewed when I could just go to my local DMV. Then not only had to go 50 miles, I had to make an appointment. And I had to be there at that time. And when I got there, going to the place, I'll never forget, it, it went through this funny traffic pattern where you had to go through this loop, and it seemed like every time I come through the loop, I would come out on the other side of where the driveway was to get into the motor vehicle. And I couldn't figure that thing out. But you know, me and my wife rode around that loop, we came down another area, came up again, we rode around another loop, and we came back, and finally we got in, and I made it on my appointment. Listen to me. I did all of that. I pressed my way for something as simple as a registration for a car. Your life's not worth that. Your child's life's not worth that pressing. Your mind, a good night's sleep and peace is not worth that pressing. All I'm telling you is faith may not come the first time. We got to go around that loop, loop, loop. Look how long it took for Abraham to get that promise met. That's all God is telling you. Look at this. For I know the plans. Jeremiah 29, when you have faith in God. We, we claim that scripture, but I'm going to read it again. And I know you know it, but listen to it again. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for the welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. When something's going on in my life, I resort back to the text. Not so the text makes me happy so I can increase my faith. God just said... I have a future, and I declare I'm going to claim that future. Mark the blameless and behold the upright, for there is a future for the man of peace. Uh, excuse me, Psalms 37 and 37 tells us to mark the blameless and behold the upright. What are we saying? Those who are walking best they can, as God said to do it. He said, for there is a future for the man of peace. He said, when you're trying to walk by faith, even though the situation is tough, there will be future, there will be peace, not only while you're going through, but in your future, because you did what God said. Here's another one. Let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. Surely there is a future, and your hope will not be cut off. Don't worry about, I'm sorry, that's Proverbs 23. 17, 18. I'll read it again. Let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord. Don't start envying what the world does or let your mind take you back and say, it shouldn't be this hard. No. Stay with it because he said, continue in that fear of God. My fear of God, that word fear there is talking about my reverence of God. My belief that I will hurt God after all he's done for my life, if I don't walk in faith now, 
I believe that God is looking at me and, and I and I make all these promises to him while I'm at worship. And oh Lord, and we sing songs just convicting how we believe in God. And yet we will hurt God by our actions for not walking in that belief. Second thing that faith will produce. It produces fruit. There will be a harvest from your faith. Um, Paul calls it a work of faith. I talked to you earlier about this. He said, you know, 1 Thessalonians 1 and 3, the work of faith. 2 Thessalonians 1 and 11, Paul refers to the work of faith. This is no words. The work of faith. Wow. The work. I got to go to work. Yes. You just got it. Just like you say, there's something I got to do. Let's say you get up in the morning and you know there's a load of laundry to do, groceries to buy, bills to pay. You may say these words out of your mouth. I got to go to work to make all of this happen. It's the same thing with your faith. I'm telling you, listening to me tonight, when this teaching is over, go to work. Go to work on your faith. It's called the work of faith. Go to work on your faith so that you understand I need this to manifest. I need this fruit to come. I'm going to work on my faith until I'm strong enough to overcome this area because I already know God is strong enough. Hallelujah. Did you hear that? I know God can handle it, so it's not being handled. It's not God. So I'm going to work on me and my faith. That means I will go in and read what I need to read because the faith, when I read it, you know, we say faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. What that saying is, when you put that word in your heart, it changes your heart, not just your perspective. It works in your heart. When your heart is sincere about something, nothing can deter you. Don't you dare. Listen, listen, I'm talking to you. God is telling you, go to work. How do I go to work? I love the fact in Acts chapter 15, you know, there was always, uh, there was a group of Judaizers or Jews, you know, as Paul was going around, Paul and Barnabas, teaching people about Jesus Christ and folk were getting saved. And other folk got angry, these Judaizers, and said, um, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised. And they went around talking this, and Paul and Barnabas got to the place where they had to refute this. And in Acts 15 and 9, they told them, Look, they don't have, well, 9 says that they lead up to this in 9. Um, they don't have to be circumcised. Circumcision don't do anything. Circumcision just marks on your body compared to the power of Jesus. What they need to do is get this word in them because this word will build their faith and faith will change their heart. I didn't say that, but listen to me. You say, Pastor, how can I get more joy to go through this? How can I get a better understanding? Word of God, put that word in your heart. It changes your heart. It gives you strength where you didn't know strength was. It gives you peace where you didn't know peace. When you change your heart, God blesses you. Look at Acts 15 and 9 says, and he was talking about the Gentiles and the Jews. He was letting them know, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Oh no, I'm a Jew. God's my father. We claim Father Abraham. How are these Gentiles getting just as strong as we are if they're not doing something that we demand? They need to be circumcised. And I started in the middle of a preposition, but understand what the text is saying. He said, God put no difference between us and them by purifying their hearts by faith. He said, you, you can't get them any purer than having them believe in Jesus as their Savior. When that faith gets into their heart, it makes them not only just like us, but it makes them so pure that they have salvation because that faith will bring them power. And what happens is they will start seeing fruit in their life because their heart has changed. Listen to Galatians 5 and 6. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Love of who? Love of God. Even though I describe this faith sometimes as being strenuous and, you know, arduous and 
You know, I got to really, it's like anything else, it's work. But when it comes to pass, when it manifests, what you should use as a motivation for that work is your love. Your love. Come on, guys. Some of young parents. You go out there and work for those kids. You got a baby. You'll go out and buy special type pampers. Get the medication they need. They need special milk that costs $10,000 a can. They need. You'll do anything because you love that child. What you got to do is get the same uh, desire with God. I'm going to walk by faith because I love God. Galatians 2 and 20, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Powerful. Um, I no longer want me to be alive. Um, in order for my faith to work, I got to consider myself dead. When Jesus finished his work, that was enough for me. I've been crucified with Christ, but because of his goodness, here it is, nevertheless I live. Yet not me, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now have in my flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You gotta let, when you sit down, when you settle down and say, all right, uh, no, uh, okay, I'm, I'm anxious, I have a panic attack, pressure's here. Push all that aside. And you can get your heart to understand, but I love God. I love God. I'm going to stand because I love God. I'll do whatever you need me to do. But let your love be that motivating force for your belief in God. Paul said, I live, he lived every day by faith, you know, trusting in God. Um, and when he did, he felt God's presence, and, and after a while, fruit came. What's fruit? Fruit means I don't want to do what I used to do, walk in my faith. I don't want to go where I used to go. I can say no where I used to. I couldn't say no before. I, I don't want to do the things that my flesh wants to do. Even if I'm in a battle, I don't want to do it. So I fight because... There's a fruit of faith that comes out of that work of faith that makes me know I'm righteous. So as a righteous man, I'm supposed to act a certain way. No, I'm not going to the crack house. I'm not going out and sleep with somebody else's wife. I'm not doing things that I used to do. That's fruit. I'm going to read this morning. I'm going to pray this morning. All of a sudden, God's presence comes into your life. And look what Philippians 1 and 11 says, Being filled with the fruit of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. It brings fruit into our life. You know, the third thing that faith teaches us is, how do I say that? You got to battle every day. I got to hurry up. I shared with you before, one of the quickest routes to the downfall of your faith is to come through something and think, you know, I'm going to, yeah, you know, I'm going to take it down. I'm going to relax. I'm going to rest. You know, I lived by faith, you know, for the last 10 years. Uh, uh, I can, you know, just six months. I, no, it's an everyday battle to walk by faith. How do we know? We hear this scripture all the time. I love it because this is, the, it, it bears down on what we need, what we need to know about faith. This little wishy-washy, namby, pamby, you know, name it, claim it, I said it, God's coming. That's not real faith. Real faith is made, you may have some sleepless nights. Um, what if your real faith comes through the tears you cry? Maybe a reality. Real faith may come through the moments of loneliness that you fight through. Real faith may come through that silencing the voice of the enemy telling you God doesn't work. All of these things are hard. But Jesus let us see as Paul was mentoring Timothy. In 1 Timothy 6 and 12, this is what we said. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called. Did you hear that? It's telling us, first of all, I gotta fight 
fight the good fight of faith. I'm not going to just wake up with a bunch of faith with all this stuff happening in my life. I got to fight for my faith. How? Then it says, watch this, hold on to eternal life. I'm not letting go of this life. God's been too good for me to flounder and fall down and quit now. Hold on to that life. And then he says, to which you were called. That's my blessing. I have been called to be blessed. I've been called to be a blessing. I've been called to victory. So it means I have to battle every day. 1 Corinthians 15, 2. When you fight that good fight of faith and you persevere, it says this, by which also you are saved if you keep in mind what was preached unto you, unto you unless we have preached in vain. Paul said, keep in mind, I had some battles, I've had some fights. I've never, my first missionary journey, my third missionary journey, my second missionary journey, I can show you some stuff. Matter of fact, when I first got saved, I had to be let down in a basket because my own folk were after me. Your faith walk will let you know there is a battle. Colossians 1.23, if you continue in the faith, if, how do I keep my faith? How do I keep my life flowing? How do I know? I won't give up. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am a minister. That's Colossians 1.23. He said, look, you will still walk in unbelief if you don't continue in your faith, grounded and settled. You have to settle that that is faith. So, those three areas are the three areas in your life that will help you destroy your, <clears throat> your unbelief. First, you got to believe you have a hope. I don't care how bad it is right now. I'm making a decree and a declaration to everybody out there. God said, there's hope. You got a future. Then you got to believe, I gotta, if I keep doing this, there's going to be fruit. My heart's going to be changed. There's going to be a change come that blesses me. And thirdly, you got to know, you know, once I get through that work of faith, okay, I'm ready to fight. Every day when you get up, fight against the unbelief like this father had to do so it does not change. And you won't have to walk around like the disciples saying, Master, why couldn't we cast it out? Because somebody may be asking me, Pastor, why couldn't I get rid of that problem in my life? How come God did this problem but I'm still walking? How come everything? When you start asking those questions, I'm telling you right now, it is unbelief. You got to build your faith so that you can walk through that situation. And you know what? You got to do it now before you decide to give up. I believe, but help my unbelief. I thank you, those of you who have been um, looking at our channel on YouTube, please go and subscribe. SBC Praise Church, all one word. If you put SBC Praise Church, you know, divide, you'll get all kinds of churches. But we are SBC, Child Baptist Church, Praise Church, SBC Praise Church. And you will go there and subscribe. Check the messages that we've been seeing. Go online and see what we're doing. Uh, www.shilohbaptist, here it is again, churches. When you put the plural in, you'll get our site. You'll find me, Dr. Duncans. You'll find uh, Shiloh Baptist Church folk. And you'll find the work that we've been doing. We believe this is an end time gospel. This is a gospel for now. We don't try to teach pretty messages. and We don't give you dessert. We try to give you the full thing you have to live. And we're going to tell you everything, the ups, the downs, and the skinny. Some folks just want to always tell you how good things are going to be. It's a lie. This message is trying to help you get to the point, because some of you may have already given up. And please, go to that website and give to this ministry. We're, we're a ministry that's open seven days a week. We're not, we don't just have a Sunday service, then a Bible study, and come back. No, and we don't take money in the church and buy stuff. We take money and do ministry, and we give it away to other people. We have a powerful social justice ministry that reaches out to the streets. I need you to check us out. Become a member. You want to become a member of our church? We have several people who want to be members that can be. And when you go to our website, you can download all the music you've heard 
um, on the intro of our services. That's all our original CD, and a lot of you have asked about that music. It's now available on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you download music. Just look for Shiloh Baptist Church, right? And you will get that. The lead uh, topic on that is now is the time. This is Pastor Duncan's. This father has taught us so many things. I know I got to go right here, but please, I want your life to be better. Go work on your faith to destroy your unbelief so you'll never, ever, ever give up. God bless you.